Okay, so we were on this problem right here. It is problem number 13. Okay, so here's what we had to do. They give us six graphs and we have to match the graph, the function with the graph, okay? Guys, the first thing I'm going to do uh, on these particular problems is I am going to find my zeros. Oh, no, no, no. What I'm first going to do is find my ending behaviors. Because this is a polynomial, I can eliminate three of these graphs because of their ending behaviors. Okay, so let's take a look at that first. First off, this right here, this has an even degree. And the number in front is positive. Okay. So what that's going to tell me, because it's an even degree, okay, because it's an even degree, they're going to go the same direction. What I need to know is, are they both going to go up or are they both going to go down? Well, positive people bring you up. So that means the ending behaviors both go up. Okay. So that being said, it can't be A. These don't go the same direction, so it can't be B. It could be C. It could be D. Not E and not F. So I've eliminated four out of the six. So what I'm going to do next is I'm going to compare the two graphs that are left. Well, we got zeros at negative three, zero, and three here. We have zeros at negative three and a positive three. So that's the next thing that I'm gonna do is I'm gonna find my zeros for the function. Well, how do we do that? You just set this function equal to zero and you factor. I can factor out an x squared and I'm left with x squared minus nine, okay? Which that will continue to factor as x squared x minus 3, x plus 3. No matter what order you go in, I don't know why I switched it, OK? So that tells me that I have to do that in red. I have zeros at 0 here because it has an x. Negative 3 and a positive 3. Those are my zeros. So automatically, I can rule this one out. Okay? It has to be D. Because I have a zero here at negative three, a zero, and a three. So that one rules this one out. So this function here is graph D. Okay? All right. So this one is graph D. Any questions right there? Okay, well, I'm going to do the exact same thing for this one here. It's going to be a little bit harder because I don't have it in this form. Okay, but still, what I can do is I can say negative 2x times x squared gives me a negative 2x to the third. Well, that has an odd degree and has a negative leading coefficient. Odd tells you they go different directions. But what is the right going to look like? Is the right side going to go up or down? If it's negative. Negative people bring you what goes down, right? So what it's going to say is it's opposite directions, and the right-hand side has to go down because it's negative. So all you have to pay attention to is the right-hand side. Even if they're the same, it's the same thing. OK, so from that, I'm going to erase all my x's. I don't really have to erase all of them, but I will. I know it has to be up on the left, down on the right. So I'm just going to look at the right-hand side. Well, these go the same direction. Can't be that one. This is up on the left, down on the right. So it's down on the right. So it could be this one still. It's not going to be C because they go the same direction. It can't be D because they're both going up. 
This one, the right-hand side goes up, so it can't be that. The difference here on F is it's fine. Okay, it's down on the right, so that's good, and they go different directions. So now we have to decide between B and F. So what I did was I looked at it and said, okay, what's the difference in them? What do I see? I'm going to compare my zeros. This one has a zero of negative three, zero, and three. This one here only has zero and three, where this one is negative three, zero, and three. Okay, so that's the, that's the main difference here. So now I'm going to go up here and find my zeros. Well, to find my zeros, I have to factor that. So I have negative 2x squared. Oops, just negative 2x. This will factor as x plus 3, x minus 3. So here I have a 0. of zero, I have a zero here of negative three, and I have a zero here of three. So that means it has to be this one, because this one here does not have a negative three to a zero. Right, so it is graph B. I didn't have to do everything, just some things that I already knew, okay? All right. Now, that takes care of that problem right there. This one right here. This is bugging me. I'm trying to record this. The, I have to zoom it in, but then it's hard because I have to keep moving my paper up and down, but oh well. All right, below is a graph of a polynomial function with real coefficients. All local extrema, guys, that you will hear, all that is is maximums and minimums, okay? Sometimes they will call maximums and minimums, maxima and minima. Just think maximum, minimum, same thing. Okay, and the local extrema counts them all. All right, the first question says, for over which intervals is the function decreasing? Now, the one nice thing is with Alex is it tells you that they're always parentheses, okay? You didn't have to remember that. So just know, but you need to know that increasing and decreasing are always parentheses. And the reason for that is if I'm walking this way, and then I'm going to walk backwards. If I'm walking forward and I stop to go backwards, right now I'm not going forward or back. So that's why it's parentheses. If it's a bracket, that includes things that I'm doing and I'm not. Okay, so right here, I've got to find where it's decreasing. You start from the left. It's decreasing right here until it gets to this point right there. Then it goes up. Then it starts decreasing, turns around and goes back down to where it gets to this point right there. Then it goes up and then it decreases to there, and now it stops and goes up again. Okay, so we have to do this in interval notation. Increasing and decreasing are x values only, okay? So right here, if I'm looking at this graph, from this section over to here, that is where it's decreasing, okay? Negative infinity to four, negative four, sorry. So that one right there. Then it's decreasing between this x value and this x value. Now this is a very bad light graph. So this is negative two, this is zero, this is two, four, six, and eight. We'll need that later. Okay. So between these two points, that graph is decreasing. So that would, you would circle that negative two to two. And then between here and here, so it's decreasing between six and eight. And that's it.
Okay? Any questions on that? Okay, so the next one. Now, the, the key thing here, though, for increasing and decreasing is you're only looking at X values. Okay, that's the key thing. Now, at which X values, we're only worried about the X, does the function have a local maxima if there is more than one value separated with a comma? Okay, remember, maxima is the same thing as a maximum. So you look at your graph where there's a hill. There's a hill right here. And there's one right here. Okay. So where does that happen at the X? At negative two. And at six. Because again, it would be the point, like this one here would be the point six, one. And this one here would be the point negative two, one. But they don't care. They only ask for the x value. All right. Now, what type? What is the sign of the function's leading coefficient? Is it going to be positive? Is it going to be negative? Or is it going to be there's not enough information? Okay. First of all, I will give you a hint. It has to do with ending behaviors. And if you look at the right right hand side of the graph. It will tell you. Okay. The right hand side of the graph only is the only thing you have to worry about. What direction is it going? Up. Uh, so now, what was it? Positive. Okay. Now, ah, uh, yeah. Okay. This, now let me ask you this. Okay. So it is positive because the graphs can change, right? If, now, this isn't the question. This is just an extra one. If I put a graph and it looked like this, let's say, what's the leading coefficient? Positive. What if it looked like this? What is the leading coefficient? Negative. And it could be looking like this. what would it be? Negative, because you only look at the right-hand side. Now, my next question, well, it comes from here. Okay, let's look at this. By the way, my answer key is wrong, and I never fix it. I, I knew at the first semester I did it. It's wrong, <laughs> okay? So I'm fixing it. I'm going to try to re-scan uh, it, but I'll probably forget by the time I get around to a computer to scan it and stuff. Okay. Which of the following is a possibility for the degree of the function? You are going to get that from how many turning points there are, okay? There is a turning point right here, okay? At your minimums and maximums. Here, here, and here, and here, right? There are five turning points. One, two, three, four, five. Remember, for the degree, it needs to be at least one more than your turning point, okay? So it, if there's five, it could be six because there's one less than the degree. Now, what's wrong on my answer sheet is the next number. It could be six and it could be eight. Do you know why it wouldn't be seven or nine looking at the graph? Yeah, they both go up. The ending behaviors both go the same direction that tells you it's even. Okay? So that's why it has to be eight. Now, on my answer sheet, I have four. <laughs> okay? I don't know what I was thinking. And the reason it has to be eight is because when you find the degree, the most turning points you can have is one less. Okay? One less than that. And if it was four, then it, you had five turning points, it's one more, it won't work. But let me ask you this. Would the degree here be even or odd ones? On this one. Even or odd degree. How do we know it is odd on this one? Here it was even. 
They both went up. Uh -huh. Different directions. Same direction, even degree. Write that down if you can't remember. Same direction, even degree. Are these an even degree right here? How do we know they're an even degree? Ending behaviors are both going down. Negative because this right-hand side goes down. These are both odd because they're going different directions. Now, when I talk about the degree, I am talking about something that might, like this one here, that first term may look like 4x to the 6th power plus blah, 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 blah. Even degree, positive, they both go up. This one here would be something like this one here, let's say, would be maybe negative 3x to the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, uh, let's say 8. Even degree, because they're both going the same direction, but they're both going down, so this is negative. Okay. This here, 1, 2, 3, 4, this might be, look like something like this, 6x to the 5th. And again, there's more to it all down through here, okay? And how do I know that? They're going different directions, so it's odd. But this right-hand side's up, so it's positive. And then this one here might be something like negative 7x to the, well, let's just do, let's do 9, I don't know. Blah, blah, blah. They go different directions, odd degree. This is going down, so the leading coefficient is 7. Okay, this one right here. Asymptotes. This means we have a fractional problem, okay? Um, they're called... Uh, I'm drawing a blank on what they're called. <laughs> um, I don't know. It'll come, it'll come back to me. Because <laughs> I cannot think of the word... Rational, that's it. I was wanting to say irrational, I'm like it's not irrational. This means it's a rational equation. You know those fractional ones that are maybe two over x plus three, where you had restrictions, okay? That's what this is gonna look like. I know that because we have asymptotes. A horizontal asymptote is an invisible line. It needs to be an equation of a line. So right here, this is at the number negative four. So our vertical asymptote is at x equals negative four. You have to have that. It has to be x is some constant, okay? Horizontal is an invisible line. We do it as a dashed or a dotted line, okay? Y equals two. If you just put two, it's wrong because it needs to be an equation of a line. Okay, domain. Guys, in this particular problem, they're all different, depending on how many uh, vertical uh, vertical asymptotes you have. Okay, So um, make sure you look over your notes as well as this review, all right? Because they're all going to be different. Right here, find the domain and range. Domain comes from your x values. Because of this asymptote, your x, you have to take that as that number out. It's not allowed because this problem, when you have negative four, it might look like this, two over X plus four. You have to take out four, negative four, because otherwise it's gonna make it undefined. So how do you do that? You say negative infinity to negative four, and you take it out, parentheses. Remember that? Parentheses, that means I can't count that one. That tells you everything to the left of that asymptote. Well, I've got right values of the asymptote. So I'm gonna start at negative four, but how do I not include it? I make it a parenthesis, and then I go to infinity. And put it in between it. Because this has a horizontal asymptote and the graph looks like this, no graph, no point touches this horizontal asymptote. It does not cross it. That horizontal asymptote is at two. 
So it can be any number but two. It can be all of these down here to negative infinity up to that two. So to do that, negative infinity up to two, and I'm going to put parentheses, okay, to take out two. Well, then I have points above that. I have points that are above that two. So I'm going to start at two, but I'm not going to count it. So I'm going to use parentheses. And I'm going to go to infinity. And put a union. OK. Now we're going to do x-intercepts and y-intercepts. I'm just going to tell you, you can have multiple. You can have none or multiple x-intercepts. You can have 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, whatever. Okay, But you can only have one y. Even though they'll say intercept or intercepts, you can only have one y. So, because it won't be a function then. Right here, x, where does it cross the x-axis? It crosses right here at 4, and that's the only part. So you're just going to hit, say, 4. The only place it crosses the y-axis is at negative 2. And that's it. And we're done. Okay. By the way, when you go to look at my answers, okay, I will do domain and range like this. Okay. We could, it had a hole at two for the domain. And we had a hole at, or a hole at negative four, I'm sorry, and a hole at two here. So it's on bright space under content. All right. The only thing is that one, I got that one mistake in there. So, all right. For this one here, it didn't give us a problem or it didn't print for whatever reason. Okay. And then this one here says graph the vertical or horizontal asymptotes. So I'm just going to graph this problem on this graph, OK? All right. Again, these aren't hard. The horizontal ones, if you did not do what I told you to do, and it's easy to tell, I could just have you do that problem right now and see if you can. If you can't, you haven't done your job now, OK? If you can't tell me vertical and horizontal asymptotes right now, guess what? You better study. Your test is Monday. And this is a big chunk of the test is vertical and horizontal asymptotes. Now, I'm not going to embarrass you guys and tell you that, you know, who does and who doesn't know it, but vertical asymptotes. And if you look at your notes, you will see this where I say, I just wrote that, but if that doesn't do it for you, you need to write more words. It comes from the denominator. What this does to me when I say this is to me, it means set the denominator equal to zero. If DN doesn't do it for you, write something down that all you have to do is look at and go, oh, this is what she was meaning, okay? All right, so I'm going to solve for x. I'm going to take x to the other side so it becomes positive. So I now have 5 equals x. That means I have a vertical asymptote at x equals 5. I just like it written that way. So I'm going to go up on this graph, and I am going to do a vertical asymptote at 5. So it's right there. Now, those seem to be the easiest ones, okay? It's the horizontal one because, first of all, you got to remember that it has to do with the degrees of the numerator and the denominator. You are going to compare the numerator degree with the denominator degree. So you got to know how to find a degree. Right here, the degree is 1 because that x has a 1. So this is 1. The denominator has, would help if I move this up. 
has a degree of one, because again, here's a one and here's a one. So this one is one as well. So we're comparing one to one. Those are equal. From here, you should know that where I know you've got a vertical asymptote at y equals three. If you don't know that, I've kept this in my notebook just for review. I don't need it anymore because I've used it enough. I don't need it. But when they are equal, you only have two things you got to remember. That's it. Okay. This one here is a none. So you don't have to worry about it. But this one here, when they are equal, you are going to take the leading coefficient of the numerator and put it over the leading coefficient of the denominator. Well, the leading coefficient of the numerator is negative three. The leading coefficient of the denominator is negative one. That gives us three. So we've got a horizontal asymptote at y equals three. So at this point, we're going to graph it right up here. And there you have it. And y equals three. Question. Okay. Vertical and horizontal asymptotes. Again, vertical asymptotes, they always come from the denominator. Negative 2x minus 3 equals 0. You're going to add 3 to both sides and get negative 2x equals 3. Divide by negative 2 and you get negative 3 halves or negative 1.5. I don't care. Okay, so if you were going to graph it, because it tells us to, but it didn't give us graph. At negative three halves, here's negative one, and here's negative two. Well, that's the same thing as negative 1.5. So you're going to have this asymptote right smack in the middle of that. Now, the horizontal ones, you compare the degree. The horizontal asymptote, you compare the numerator degree with the denominator degree. Now, here the degree is two. Here the degree is one. So that means the numerator is larger than the denominator. You gotta know what it is. You don't. You need to take your notes out. When it's larger, there is none. Okay? So there's no horizontal asymptote. There's a thing called a slant asymptote. You don't have to find it. So, because look here, if you did this, and you plug the, uh, I thought I had it in here, 3x squared plus 7 divided by negative 2x minus 3. I'm going to put this in zoom 6. See this little funky curve? There's actually more to this graph. You just can't see the left-hand side of it. Um, right here, there's this asymptote. That x equals negative 1.5. But if I put this in a zoom 8, okay, looks a little funky, right? The pixels are too big. This actually comes down still. Your calculator is lying to you, okay? But it keeps going down here, and it keeps going up here because it's really close to that negative 1.5. You just can't see it, okay? But there is this line also an, a slant asymptote that goes down through here. Now in this class, we don't have to find that. If you were taking pre-calculus, we would actually find that, okay? But we don't have to, so we're not worried about it. All right, more comparing with graphs. Don't let this overwhelm you. The first thing you need to do is find asymptotes. When you find the vertical asymptote right here, 
you're going to have two, okay? Because it's an x squared. So you're going to take that 2x squared minus 4x minus 6 and set it equal to 0. And I'm not going to make a mistake this time. You're going to factor out a 2. <laughs> I factored it without factoring out the 2. It still worked. Even on, you're going to see it on my answers if you look at them. But if I factor out a 2, I get x squared minus 2x minus 3 equals 0. And then I factor this as x minus 3, x plus 1 equals 0. So I actually have two uh, vertical asymptotes, one at x equals 3 and the other one at x equals negative 1. OK. Well, looking at the graphs, it looks like it still could be this one. Not this one, there's one at two. My guess is the this one here, the ones that I mark out are going to be for the second one. Um, negative one here and three here, it still can be C. It cannot be D. It can be E, but it cannot be F. Okay, so we've narrowed it down to three. Well, we also, it looks like, like with A and C, the horizontal asymptote's different. So let's find the horizontal. So I'm going to compare the degrees. They're equal. Okay. The degrees are equal, which means you have to put the leading coefficient of the numerator, which is one, over the numerator, uh, the Leading coefficient of the denominator, which is two. Okay. Now, when you are studying, I actually did all this if you're looking at my notes. Okay. By the way, see how I didn't factor out a two? And I was like, eh, oh well, I still got negative one, so it doesn't. Okay. So by having a horizontal at y equals a half, I can rule out C. I can't, so it's between A and F. So what I did, are A and E, okay? What I did for these two is I looked to see what was different. Well, look, this Y-intercept and this Y-intercept are different. And finding the Y-intercept is so easy. When you find the Y-intercept, you are taking out your X and you're putting in zero. So when I take put in zero right here, I'm going to get one over negative six. So I get negative one six. Okay. Because when I plug in zero, that's what I get. One on the top, negative six on the bottom. Okay. So can it be up here at A? Because that's a positive, right? The only one it could be is E. All right, so this one is graph E. That's because I because that's where I looked first. I looked to see what's different. It's rather going to be x intercepts, y intercepts, you know that type of things. Okay, because guys, first of all, yeah, you can get your graph to your calculator to graph it. But guys, if you're not in the right zoom, like right here, this one shows it, but it doesn't look what the graph looks like. Look, it stopped it right here when it really goes down. But then if I put it in zoom six, now I only see part of the graph. So it may not help you to graph it because you have to know how to use your calculator in order to see the whole graph, okay? But still, even then, you got to know about those asymptotes and stuff. All right, so yeah, I'm just looking at the things that are different, but I do notice that it's always, you know, we ruled out three from the vertical. We ruled out another one from the horizontal. Then we ruled out the last one with the y-intercept. So that's what I'm gonna do the same thing here. Vertical asymptote, set the denominator equal to zero. I get x plus 3, 
x minus 2. I factor it, okay? So when I factor it, I get x equals negative 3 here, and I get a vertical asymptote at x equals 2. Well, I erased everything. I probably should have kept it, but oh well. <laughs> um, that rolls out that one. This one's still in it, okay? This one is ruled out. I know it's not E because that one won. Negative three and two, negative three and two. Okay, so it's between B, D, and F so far. Well, let's do a horizontal. We compare our degrees. Numerator degree is less than the denominator degree. That means we have a vertical asymptote at y equals zero. That rules out B. It's back to, it's, we're, we're talking graph D or graph F. What do I notice? Look at the y-intercept here and look at it here. This one's negative, this one's gonna be positive. So I need to know. Now, yes, I could just graph this and see what it looks like, but if I'm too lazy to go get my calculator, this is what I'm gonna do. And I didn't need to know exactly, I just need to know which one's which because finding the y-intercept, I can look at it and go negative or negative one half because it's three over negative six, which gives me negative one half. I didn't know, I didn't need to go out. I would have been done with this before you even plugged it in, okay? So negative one half, so that rules out D. It has to be graph F. So you know, oh, I didn't write it down here. This is graph E, and this one we found to be graph F. So I did them all by process of elimination, and I came up with the right one. Okay. All right, use a graphing calculator to find all the real zeros. Do you know how to do that, or do I need to show it to you really quick? If I have time, I'll come back, because I know there's two that I want to do, this one being one. And I'm not going to show you every single step to it, because we, this takes a lot. It's a long process, and I have all the work that's already been done on bright space. But here, when we have an inequality like this, it's going to be in intervals, okay? So, and this says graph it on a number line, but I think I did that and then put it in interval notation. I did. Okay, right here, my critical points are 6 and negative 5. So what I'm going to go do is over here, I'm going to, plug, I'm going to do an open circle at negative 5 and an open circle at six. And the reason they're open circle is because it's just a greater than. Now, the other day when I did this, I had to pick test points, okay? I picked a test point somewhere to the left of negative five. Let's just say, I'm gonna say negative eight because that's what my answer sheet says, okay? Here, I'm sure I picked zero because that's there. I always pick zero if I can. And I'm gonna take, take a test point right in here and I'm gonna pick nine and I wished I hadn't, but well, let me, do, let me pick eight here. And I'm gonna do it differently. Okay, if I take my negative eight and I plug it in here, okay? I'm going to get negative 8 minus 6, which gives me negative 14. Right here, I'm going to get negative 3. Is that going to give me a number that's greater than 0? Negative 14 times a negative 3. Does it give me a number that's greater than 0? Yeah. Do I care what it is? No. I just know it's positive, right? Positive numbers are greater. Now, it does give us 42, though. Okay, greater than zero. So that worked. So that means all of these numbers will work in this problem. Then I'm gonna pick zero. If I plug in zero right here, I get negative six. If I plug in zero here, I get five. Is that gonna give me a number that's greater than zero? 
No, it's going to give me a negative one. So that doesn't work. And then I'm going to pick eight and I'm going to plug it in. When I plug in eight here, I get two. When I plug in eight right here, I'm going to get 13. Is that going to give me a number that's greater than zero? Yeah. So that means it's going to work right here. Because I get 26. Okay. So now, that was all this question asked you to do, but you know on your test, you're going to have to write an interval notation. Okay. Interval notation, negative infinity up to this negative five. It's an open circle, so it's a parenthesis. If it was filled in, you would put a bracket. Then union, you go over here and you go six, uh, parenthesis because it's not filled in, and you're going to go to infinity. Okay. All right. I'm going to do this one here too. The reason is because it's a little bit more work. We're going to, it says on a number line. I'm going to always go to your interval notation. Because the number line, I use the number line to do interval notation. Okay, I have to get this because it's an x squared. You have to get everything on one side and get it compared to zero. So you're going to say x squared minus four, or no, plus four x, right? Is less than or equal to zero. Now I am going to take out an x. I'm going to factor out an x. And I get x plus four equal to zero. This is nothing new that I'm doing here. This is stuff we've been doing forever. Okay, It's just an inequality part. Here, my critical point is going to be zero. And here, it's going to be negative four. Okay, When I put this on a number line, negative four goes on the left and zero goes on the right. Just pick some test points somewhere to the left of negative four. I'm going to pick, let's say, negative five. Right here, I really didn't get to use zero, so I'm just going to use negative one. And right here, I'm going to use one. I'm going to keep them as small as I have to, as I can. Now, the question is, is are these going to be open or closed circles? Kind of closed because it's equal. So now, instead of using parentheses at those, I'm going to use brackets because they're included. We just got to figure out where. Here, 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 two of the places, three of the places. What, where is it going to be? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to plug this negative five into this equation right here. Doesn't matter if it's here or here, but I'm just going to use it here. I'm going to get positive 25 minus, because 4 times negative 5 gives me 20. Because that gives me 5. That's not less than 0. So that doesn't work. When I plug in negative 1 right here, I'm going to get a positive 1 plus negative 4. Or minus 4, right? Doesn't matter. Minus 4. That is going to be some number less than zero. It's going to be negative three is less than or equal to zero. Okay. Sorry, that's messy. And I plugged in negative one. When I square it, I get one. And four times a negative one gives me a negative four. Okay. So this is a true statement. So that means all of these numbers between here are going to work. I just got to check over here. This gives me one when I square it, plus four times one gives me four. That is not less than zero, that's five. That's not less than zero. Now remember the other day I was doing frowny faces. Yay, this one works, so that one works, okay. You don't have to do it, but that's what I did to hopefully help you remember. So because this isn't true, none of those is gonna work. Now, when we go to write this in interval notation, it is going to be a bracket because it's included. Negative four to zero in a bracket. These critical points are the numbers that give you zero. If I plugged in negative four here, it would give me zero. 
If I plugged in zero here, this would give me zero. That's the equal part. Okay, this one is on, if I have time, I'll come back. The nice thing here is it's already factored for you and the zeros are negative two, three, and negative eight. And you go through the same process that we just did for these two here, okay? If I have time, I'll come back to it. If not, it's on bright space. What I want, and same thing with this one here, okay? Um, by the way, multiplicities. This has a zero of negative eight. What does that mean if it has a multiplicity of two? What's that gonna do? What's that graph gonna look like? It's gonna come and hit it and do what? Anybody remember? This is the one where it bounces back. It bounces back in the same direction. If it's coming in from the top, it's gonna to bounce back to the top. If it's coming into that negative eight from the bottom, it's gonna bounce back. Multiplicity, we cover that. My suggestion to you guys, because again, this is your last test was way before spring break. I would go over this review and all the notes that we've taken in class, because there's, let's face it, sometimes I'm going to miss something that's going to be on the test. All right, right here, it says use this information to view, it says use regression to find the quadratic function that models this. So here's what we're going to do. Go into your calculator. Do you remember how to do that? What do, do you remember what we hit? Because it's different than most of them. Stat, right. We're going to hit stat. And we're going to put this, the top numbers under L1. We're going to put the bottom numbers under L2. And the way you get to that is you edit. So I'm going to hit one. Now I've got numbers in here that I need to switch out. Go up here, highlight that, hit clear, hit delete. Don't hit, go, don't go up there and hit delete. I think I hit, I think I said delete. Here's what you want to do. You want to highlight that. You want to clear that and you want to hit enter. Because if you delete it, it's going to delete that L1. I can get it back for you, but it's going to clear it. Okay, because I did that last class. So now we're going to put 30 to 75, count up by fives underneath the, uh, L1. 30, 35, 40, 45, and so on. Double check your numbers. I mean, we have a way to check it today, but if this was your test, you'd want to really make sure. Okay, everybody have it in there? Now we need it to calculate. And the key thing is that it says quadratic. That's the key thing, quadratic. So here's what you're gonna do. You're gonna go back to stat. You needed to calculate it. So you go over to calc, and because it's a quadratic, you hit five. If it said linear or a line, you would hit four. But because it says quadratic, you hit five. Hit enter until highlight is ha highlighted. Hey. Calculate is highlighted, hit enter. And here is your A, your B, and your C. And it says to four decimal places. So right here, down here at part one, you're going to say 0 0.0733 S squared. I wouldn't care if you put X. I don't care. It doesn't bother me. 
minus, the reason I'm using S is because of this here, uh, 1.8224S, and then plus 50.7272. Okay, now, yes, you will notice that they gave you that answer. Oh, this is 7.3, not 7.2. Okay, they gave it to you, but you know on the test, I'm not gonna, okay, I'm not gonna do that. So you, we figured it out, okay? We just put this in front of the A, this in for B, and this in for C. Now, use this function, the part two, it says you, this is just like where you put the answers and this is where they're asking. Um, Use that function to predict the stopping distance for a car traveling 66 miles per hour before brakes are applied. Now, the one thing I didn't do is I didn't tell you what this stood for, did I? Because I was trying to get it done, but now we have to do, know this. Okay, it says the braking distance required for a car to stop depends on numerous variables such as speed of the car the weight of the car, reaction time, the coefficient of friction between the tires and the road. For certain vehicles on a stretch of highway, the braking distance, so this is the braking distance. And S is your miles per hour, that is your speed. So now we know what we can do. S is our speed. So when we, our speed is 66 miles per hour, that means we take 66 and put it in for S into our formula. Okay, so what we're going to do is just log that in. You're gonna say 0 0.0733 times 60 squared, or you could store it either way, minus 1.8224 times 60 plus 50.7273. And it's gonna take, oh, that's wrong. Where is my answer? Oh, I use 60. Speed limit was 66. So I need to change that. Mm -hmm. I missed a parenthesis there. You all know, are just gonna let me do that. And does it say, let's just round it to the nearest home. Yeah, round to the nearest foot. So it's 250. And then the last one on this page, suppose that the car, we're still using that same formula. Suppose that the car is traveling 62 miles per hour before the brakes are applied. If a deer is standing in the road at a distance of 280 feet from the point where the brakes were applied, will the car hit the deer? Well, you take the same thing, the same formula, and you change the 66 to the 62, and it's 200 and basically 20 miles, um, I'm sorry, feet, you're 220 feet away, right? And the deer is 280 feet. So are we gonna hit the deer? No, okay, we will not hit the deer, okay? Now, I did every problem except, I think, these two here, okay, 20 and 21, and 25, okay? Now, all these answers are posted in Brightspace. So, hopefully.